Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to range a fire tonight with four people from different walks of life. And we're going to start out with a brief mention of Arthur Gelb, who died recently at the age of 90. And Arthur Gelb was an influential figure at the New York Times for over 60 years. He was a reporter, a correspondent, a critic. He was especially an arts critic. He was an editor and then a managing editor. And he worked very closely with his friend A.M. Rosenthal, and together they shaped the post-World War II New York Times into the journalistic institution it is today for better and occasionally for worse. One of his great roles at the New York Times was a nurturer of talent, both as a critic and as an editor, and he's in some part responsible for the careers of people as widely varied as Barbara Streisand to Maureen Dowd. One of those legendary newspaper figures the likes of you won't see very much again. Our main subject tonight is another nice Jewish boy from New York City, from Queens, Dr. Gerald Edelman, who died at the age of 85, and he was a 1972 co-winner of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, along with Rodney Robert Porter, for his discovery of the structure of antibodies. Antibodies are the human body's response to foreign proteins or antigens. And in the 1950s and 60s, when Dr. Edelman was doing his work, scientists were working on discovering the protein structures of molecules such as insulin, which we talked about when we did our podcast on Frederick Sanger, and the newly discovered nucleic acids, RNA and DNA. Dr. Edelman discovered that antibodies contrary to what people believed, were made up of two chains of proteins, a heavy chain and a light chain that were bound by disulfide bonds. And this was revolutionary, and it was perhaps the most important discovery in the evolving field of immunology. Like some other Nobel laureates, after Dr. Edelman won the Nobel Prize, he went into a different field. He went into neuroevolution, where he spent the rest of his career trying to figure out how the nervous system developed. His findings were a little more controversial in that field, but his work was still groundbreaking. I'm going to play you a brief interview with Dr. Edelman with Nobel.org and how his scientific career developed. I, in fact, dropped out of school. I was totally bored by lectures of the kind they were giving. I finally arranged through my mother again to get a deal gone where I could have a key to the library, didn't have to attend lectures, just took exams in laboratories, which they did at Osinus. Very nice. So it was very free thinking. And what I learned is this, that the faculty did not use the library. Other than that, it's fine. Then Penn, the University of Pennsylvania, was the first time I was exposed to what I might call a broad view and deep view of scholarly effort. So that was sort of inspiring. And from there, I went on to Harvard to Massachusetts General. It was the first time I could see a deep connection between knowledge and skill, which is, I think, an interesting thing. I mean, if you do medicine, besides the horizon it gives you on humanity, you have to apply a certain kind of judgment and skill. Of course, it is a scientific judgment in full because... Uh, your facts are always incomplete. It's, I'd say it's a paramilitary art, let's put it that way. And I stayed on and did this internship, house officer uh, internship at Harvard, simply because I said, well, you know, you've gone this far, go. But I still intended to do science. And then I volunteered in the Army, which took me to Paris. And I remember that I had arranged to get a kind of job in research at Walter Reed Hospital in Washington. And when the orders got cut and it said Paris, but the main thing is that there was a, a library on the Champs-Élysées called uh, the American Library. And that was a book, that was the first set of books I read on protein chemistry. And I decided in my naive way, I read a book about immunology and I said, oh, I'm going to do the antibody molecule. They had all the stuff about antigens and the reason they did was because of Lonsteiner, Carl Lonsteiner, Nobel laureate from the Rockefeller, maybe one of the greatest, if not the greatest scientist after Avery at the Rockefeller. And he had shown that you could make antibodies to any organic compound that had enough structure. Now, that, that was an extraordinary thing. So everybody paid a lot of attention to the antigen. Of course, I and my naivete didn't know the state of protein chemistry at the time. Sanger had just maybe begun to do his sequence of insulin. I saw this egg-shaped thing that said, well, that can't be it. And why are they talking about that? It's the antibody that counts, so I'll go and do that. And so in that way, naivete paid off. You then returned to the newly formed Rockefeller University. This is 1957. This is your PhD thesis. Correct. And you did the work for which you were then awarded the Nobel Prize in 72 with Rodney Porter. Yeah. Yeah. Curious. curious. Uh, how, look, a lot of this is all ha- having to do with luck. I, I, I forget who told me the story of Niels Bohr and my friend again, uh, Isidore Rabi, 
who's a close friend of his and brought a lot of quantum mechanics to America in the European style at the right time. He was visiting Bohr at his country house, according to this story. Bohr was showing off, and he showed him this room, and above the door there was a lucky horseshoe. And he said, Neil, certainly you don't believe in that stuff. And Bohr said, I'm told it works whether you believe in it or not. So there was this kind of luck factor. And there was this naivete factor where I said, uh, I was unimpeded by knowledge, right? I said, I'm going to do it. Now, Stein and Moore, the two people who won the chemistry prize at the same time that I did this physiology medicine prize, they had been doing ribonuclease, molecular weight of the order of 15,000, a little smaller. And when I said I was going to do a molecule of 150, they thought I was mad. And they were, in a way, right. But it turned out that a hidden variable showed up, namely that I showed that the molecule had chains. And one of the small chains was within reach. Once you got that, you could get the whole thing. So there you are, fortunate. Fortunate, but initially disbelieved. You published, you published your initial results in a one-page Jack's paper oh, yes. in 59. Science has this curious feature in which somehow... Its practitioners seem to borrow the notion of virtue because, of course, if you're not mad, you're not going to lie, you're going to be straightforward about your data, and you're not going to show prejudice. But in the bibliography and other places, there's much of that kind. So what happened, in fact, is that I was told by a number of people that I was mad, that my discovery was going to ruin my career if I published it. And finally, out of desperation and 169 experiments later, I said, I'm going to do it anyhow, and I'm going to do it in a journal where they don't have any sort of influence. So I did. I sent it as a letter to the Journal of American Chemical Society. If you'd like, I'll leap forward in time to 1972 in Stockholm, a place in which the largest uh, export of Sweden occurs, called the Nobel Prize. And I was sitting on the stage, and I, by the way, I had been ill. I had a little gastroenteritis. I hadn't taken my medical kit with me. My sister, however, had tincture of opium. I knew this much about folk medicine that that could sort of calm your gut. But I took four times the recommended dose, and I was spooked sitting there like this, saying to myself, my God, these Swedes have some high fi set. It happened to be the Swedish Philharmonic behind me, but I couldn't turn. People said my eyes were so marvelously fixed for television. I was in complete trance. When I opened the description of the prize, which you only do right at that time. Okay. They referred to that paper. But at the time, Rod Porter, who won the prize with me, had published a paper, and this is why I think people were disconcerted. He published a paper in which he was a single long chain, and he was a doyen. You know, he's a student of Sanger, yeah. and he had real scope. I was no, nobody, in a sense. And so I was told, you know, you contradict him, and bow wow. Yeah. Well, I did anyhow. And it turned out to be right. There we are. Interesting that there was no doubt in your mind. 169 experiments, you mentioned. Well, that was doubt. 169 <laughs> was one, one episode after another. Doubt. <laughs> sure. Science is skepticism. But skepticism followed by some kind of conviction that, look, knowledge must be dispersed and you'll take the risk. I mean, the fact is if you do all the things you can do, then, of course, you'll just wait and see how it comes out, which is what happened. Since you're mentioning what science is, I'd like to repeat that quote from your banquet speech. You say, science is imagination in the service of the verifiable truth. Yes, with a big emphasis on imagination. Imagination unrestrained, or even imagination like poetic imagination, will not do in science. But you begin pretty much that way, don't you? You begin a sort of associative ambiguity, and then you clean it up with math and physics and whatever else you have at your disposal. But you don't clean up everything, do you? I believe one of the great problems of modern science, and certain aspects is success of a certain kind breeds failure because everybody becomes enormously specialized and expert and they don't look on either side and you don't get this kind of cross-fertilization and association that really gives rise to very remarkable science. Dr. Gerald Edelman. We're going to move on now to Gordon Willis who died recently at the age of 82 and Gordon Willis was one of the most important movie cinematographers of the second half of the 20th century. He was responsible for a lot of Woody Allen movies, including Annie Hall. He was responsible for all the President's Men, but his most important cinematography was done for the Godfather trilogy, and he's best known for his dark, evocative style. Here, in an interview, he talks about it. I just simply pictured things a different way. In some cases, it caused a ruckus now and then, you know, because it's like saying, well, we can't do that because that's never been done before. Well, 
Well, I never did it in that spirit. I just simply did it because I liked it. We're reliable people, people that aren't going to be carried away. We're not murderers. His imprint on the film was indelible when Godfather came out. I mean, that was a job of cinematography, you know, that everybody couldn't help but notice. Honestly, what have I ever done to make you take me so disrespectful? Uh, a lot of things that I do with overhead lighting or a lot of things with that form of lighting actually came out of a necessity to deal with Marlon Brando in a given kind of makeup. It was an example of designing something to make one person work and it was extended throughout the rest of the movie. I got a lot of criticism because they said, well, you can't see Brando's eyes. There were times in some of his scenes where I deliberately did not want to see his eyes so that you saw this mysterious um, human being thinking about something or about to do something, but you didn't really know what the hell was going on. Gordon, the Prince of Darkness, huh? Uh, I haven't, like, examined uh, underexposing a lot because I'm terrified of it. But with people like Gordon, who know just how much to do it and uh, all that kind of thing, uh, he has made an art of underexposure. I may have gone too far a couple of times. I think there was a scene between Al and his mother. Uh, was played by me. I did one scene, I went too far. I think Rembrandt went too far a couple of times. It wasn't the fact that, that it was so dark. It was the fact that the studio said... How are we going to show this at the driving? That's the old habits to say. You got to get, you got to put a light in. You got to see the people. You got to see the people because of the drive-ins, the drive-ins, the drive-ins. Well, the drive-ins were going out. That didn't mean much to us. When I shot Godfather One, my decision to use yellow in the movie. It, the movie was very yellow, yellow red. It bordered on this kind of brassy feeling. The reasons for that were because I just thought it was right. But yellow broke out in the motion picture business related to period movies for a long time after that. It's not one thing that you do from a visual point of view that makes anything work. The art direction has to be right, the wardrobe has to be right, the shot structure has to be right, and the lighting has to accommodate whatever it is you're introducing related to filtering, etc. So you can't just do one thing. There's no mistake in Gordy Willis. The magnificent thing that was done was the fact that he came back to it after several years came right in and you could put the three together they never stopped making the picture yeah, which is uh, I, I think a tribute well as long as we're talking about gangster films let's talk about a singer who died recently at the age of 83 and was featured in films like Goodfellas and Casino and in The Sopranos Nero Louis Vitaliano aka Jerry Vale he was one of the Italian singers of that era along with guys like Al Martino Vic Damone and Dean Martin wasn't as good as Dean but he was a crooner and Ed Sullivan liked him so he was on a lot of Ed Sullivan shows and he became familiar to the American public his biggest hit was back in 1956. Not as good a version as Ray Charles, but not bad. You give your hand to me, and then you say hello, and I can hardly speak. My heart is beating so, and anyone could tell. You think you know me well, but you don't know me. Pure late 50s, early 60s stuff. Frank loved him, by the way. First met him at Lindy's in the early 50s, and he got him gigs in Las Vegas for the rest of his life. I had to debate with my producer, Sid Tepps, on the next one. He didn't want me to use Valari because Dean Martin's version is better, but I really don't like Aldo Las. I'm going with Valari. I'll make it up to you, Sid. Valari. Let's fly way up to the clouds, away from the maddening crowds. You're right, Sid. Dean's is better, but you can imagine sitting in an Italian restaurant eating pasta for Zulu and listening to that one. I want to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tapps. That cheesy Jerry Vale approach is sort of out of style now, but it evokes the era of the late 50s and early 60s. And he did a lot of covers of a lot of the popular songs back then. And here's his cover of one of the most popular songs that evokes that era. I wonder if JFK and Jackie listen to it. The winter is forbidden till December. And exits March the 2nd on the dot. My order summer lingers through September. In Camelot. 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 I know it sounds a bit bizarre. But in Camelot. 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 
That's how conditions are.